Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Today, I conduct a conversation with an English conductor who shot to fame after winning the Leeds Conducting Competition in 2005. Since then, he spent eight years as chief conductor in Nuremberg, and he is currently the music director of the National Arts Centre Orchestra in Ottawa, Canada. It's a great pleasure to welcome Alexander Shelley. Alex, it is lovely to meet you, to see you, and to speak with you today. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on your podcast. What a pleasure. Not a problem at all, and the pleasure's all ours, our, mine and the listeners. Um, I think it's fair to say you come from a musical family, uh, both parents, um, musicians. Uh, the, my normal question is, when does music first come into your life? For, for you, I would say it was the day you were born, but when did, was it something that you thought, you know what, I might want to, you know, um, start playing the piano or the cello or whatever it is? Yeah. When did it first really Actually, come into your life? You know, funnily enough, it wasn't the day I was born. It was probably the, the moment I was conceived, because back then, my... Both of my parents were very, very active. My mom, during the course of my young life, uh, basically retired. Um, but when I was conceived, they were, uh, my father was traveling a lot as a soloist and my mother and he would also play two piano recitals and uh -huh. concerts and orchestras around the world. So I think while I was, I was gestating, uh, my mother had her tummy pressed up against the piano and, and that sound, that resonance, um, was coming through to me the whole time. And my first few years were, I was surrounded by, by, by pianos. There were five grand pianos in my, uh, my parents' house when I was born. It was coming from every angle. And um, I think, you know, it can't help but, but I mean, I don't know anything about it. It can't help but have impact my, my, impacted my development. And I, I do recall very much um, feeling music as a language um, uh, before I had language, it was a very, very clear um, and striking mode of communication. When I heard my parents play a phrase on an instrument, I knew what it meant. I, re I really do recall that as a very, very small baby feeling what was meant. Mm. Um, and of course, that's what language is, right? It's feeling what somebody else is trying to communicate. So that was that was there from my my earliest days and months, um, and. Uh, I, you know, there's pictures of me and my nappy trying to play notes on the piano. And then my grandmother was a cellist. And, and uh, so I became interested in the cello. And ultimately, um, I took piano lessons with my grandma and my, my mom. Uh, and then cello became the sort of focus of my attention. And I went off and studied that. Um, well, I went to school, normal school, while playing the cello and piano. And I, I got a music scholarship. So it was sort of very much a part of my, yeah. my uh, every day. But to your question about when I decided that music was going to really be my profession, I think it was always there in the in the in a sense in the front of my mind. Um, my parents, probably because they come from the profession, never pushed it. They said, mm. "If you're going to become a musician, the drive has to come from you because no one else is going to make you practice after a certain age. No one else is going to give you the." the sort of blistering uh, <laughs> ambition that you need to just keep on cutting through and keep on working and 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 also the love for it that is required um just like in sports to to apply yourself every day to go above and beyond uh, and they were absolutely right i had sort of ups and downs during my teenage years uh, i think because of the start that i was given i was kind of fairly advanced and i didn't have to work particularly hard to do well on the instruments mm. um, but then you reach that critical moment where you do you know you have to to give of yourself and and actually, it was in my late teens, or maybe even mid-teens, that I started to gravitate towards um, conducting. I, I always loved scores. We had lots of scores at home. My dad also uh, conducted from when I was a young age, and um, I was around orchestras all of my childhood. I loved the instrument of the orchestra, yes. the, the, the pure range of, of, of what it offered, and the, the different types of attack and sustain, and all those things that on a, on a piano, a very particular and on a cello are very particular. Uh, I love that variety. And I was always drawn to listening to those pieces, looking at the scores. Um, and I asked at school, I said, I said, look, you know, could I conduct the orchestra one day? And they said, yes, which was kind of amazing that, looking back. It was absolutely awful. But I, I, um, I conducted the Haydn Symphony, uh, Symphony 104 and a Mozart flute concerto in one of our concerts. And um, I think that was a moment where I felt the joy and fulfillment um, that was to become uh, my future and realized that that was a path I wanted to follow. 
you go on to the Royal College of Music and the Robert Schumann Hochschule in Dusseldorf to study, mm-hmm. were you... I mean, you know, if you look at um, the, my listeners know all about the, the, you know, the fact that I do my homework and I look on Wikipedia and your website and your agent's website and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, you had many good cello teachers and master classes. And so the cello was still something you were taking very seriously and doing uh, to a very high level. Um, yeah. But was it running alongside conducting uh, at the RCM? I mean, I know that you yeah. had conducting lessons at the the Robert Schumann Hochschule, but did you have anything at the RCM? No, RCM was a pre-degree course, and I spent almost the entire year messing around, uh, (laughs) drinking, going out with friends, uh, really not focusing whatsoever on what I should have been focusing on. Or maybe I focused on exactly what I should have been focusing on. I don't know, but I just had had a a wonderful uh, laugh that year, and I did, you know, practice and have my lessons, but I was focused on the cello and focused on sort of, you know, that and I was going to go to Eastman to study with uh, my then teacher Steve Doan, um, but I was I was uh, on the advice of my my first serious cello teacher Tim Hugh from the London Symphony Orchestra, uh-huh. um, and then well now then Covent Garden and now of neither um, he he had studied with this man called Johannes Gorutsky uh, only for a year in Germany, but he thought that we would get on very well. Um, Johannes was also a conductor and he was very broad in his musical thinking. It wasn't, you know, I'm a cellist and that's what I do and everything's yeah. cello. Um, and Tim sensed that we might enjoy working with each other. So I went to Prussia Cove and I did master classes with him and just absolutely hit it off. And so within a few months, I, you know, f- flipped my plans completely. I went over to Dusseldorf. I did um, uh, my audition there. Uh, I flunked my entrance exams because I didn't have any German, which is it's mm. so weird to talk about this. I, I lived in Germany for basically 20 years. I speak to my son in German. Um, it, is, it is completely yeah. my other now kind of mother tongue. Yeah. So the idea that I went and I did an audition without any German and that I flunked my exams because I didn't understand the questions actually sounds funny to me now, but um, that's what happened. Um, uh, but they, they, they said you can come back at the, uh, the, in the week before the first semester and you can take the exams. And if you pass, you can just start. The mm. next week it sounded mm. a bit risky for me but i basically spent the summer learning uh you know the the learning german the essentials and definitely all the musical language i went and did it and uh passed the exam happened to meet my best friend there as well that week he he hadn't passed the exam because he was just useful at all the harmony and le- uh, harmony and, and and that stuff which was very no. funny but um yeah so i went to germany and um it was there that um, conducting lived alongside cello because yeah. I started uh, immediately an ensemble with my uh, with my friends and colleagues there that we called uh, Schumann Kamerate because well at the time we all thought that Robert Schumann's entire life has been spent in Dusseldorf because everything there is called Robert Schumann that has to do right. with music turns out it was only three years and they weren't particularly happy years but you know <laughs> that's, that's you know um, <laughs> anyway. Um, we, we sort of built the orchestra together. I, I ran it and directed it and conducted it. Sometimes I play directed, you know, Haydn concertos, I just hit the instrument and play. Um, other times I conduct. And we, we ultimately built um, a really fabulous uh, young ensemble. And we started a series um, at the main recital sort of chamber orchestra hall there called the Schumann Saal, mm. um, which uh, ended up becoming a very, very successful cycle. It was, it was about bringing people of our generation then, you know, I was, I was 20 something, 21. Um, we all were to the concert hall. And yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, it very much coexisted, but I did my degree and my master's degree as a cellist. And while I was doing my master's, I studied uh, conducting. And you studied with a name I have yet to encounter in mm-hmm. 90 episodes or so of the podcast, Thomas yeah. Cambridge. Yeah. Um, I'm, his, I'm his only student. Oh, wow. Um, well, therefore you'll be the, perfect person to ask what sort of teaching style did he have I mean you know there are famous names I mentioned almost on a weekly basis Swarovski in Vienna who was Mm -hmm. very much score based but not stick technique Musin Mm -hmm. the exact opposite Colin Metters Mm -hmm. is more stick so I'm told than score how was Thomas Gabrich in his approach to teaching you Uh, initially very stick because he, he, he approached me, I was, he was at one of my concerts. He, he ran the opera studio at the uh, music college, at the, oh. the Robert Schumann uh, Hochschule. And so he conducted all the productions. He was a, um, a Kapellmeister at the Deutsche Oper am, am Rhein. Um, 
fabulous technique himself. Um, and he came to, to one of my concerts with the, the Camerata and, and it, it literally, he walked up to me. We, you know, we, I played in the orchestra under him at, at college and stuff, but he just came up to me and said, look, I thought that was a wonderful concert. Uh, I think you have all the talent necessary to make a career of being a conductor, but uh, I think there's things I could do to help guide you. Mm. Uh, would you be interested in working together? And I threw my hands up to Jesus and said, yes, please. Because yeah. at the time, the conducting class there was not quite to my taste the way that I observed it working. Because I, I was in the orchestra. I could see the students coming through. I could see the way they were spoken to yeah. by the then teacher. And I always felt terribly for them because they were never given an opportunity to actually rehearse before they were given sort of criticism, if you will. <laughs> they they just yeah. didn't have a chance to start driving the car. It was always like, stop, don't do that, um, yes. which is, you know. Um, but Thomas and I had a very, uh, I think, well, you can tell me after all your conversations, uh, unusual way of working, which was that uh, I would prepare and then we would go and meet in one of the rooms in the college, uh, just me and him in complete silence. And I would start conducting mm. and he would watch and we'd both be listening in our heads. Um, and then we'd work like that. He'd just stop and talk through it and, and, and discuss alternatives. We, um, but we worked in silence for mm. all the years we worked together. We never had an instrument with us um, or never used an instrument. Um, and he was, he's a beautiful technique he has, a very, very clear and very beautiful technique and very um, clear conception of the fundamentals uh, and a very practical teacher as well. I mean, he had a lot of experience himself. He was a Kapellmeister who was sort of regularly going in to just conduct operas off the cuff, um, yeah. you know, as, as is, is necessary. And we, we worked on that basis. Um, but then we talked about scores and, and study, uh, of course, during the course of it. Um, and ultimately, I think I prepare very differently to the way that he did. Mm. Um, now and uh, again if I look back 20 25 years my relationship with scores used to be like my relationship with with cello parts I put them on the stand and just sort of feel yeah. like, what, what, do I, what do I feel about this yeah. um, uh, but that changed drastically and I have like a completely different way of, of, of doing that now in order to try and get back to how do I feel about this, but I take a much more circuitous and, and perhaps sort of cerebral route to try and then get back to what I feel because, you know, what do we feel about anything in life? It's all a sum of how we perceive things, right? So if you yeah. can change your perception and your depth of knowledge about things, then the way you feel about it is different. So when we talk about gut, that doesn't mean really anything. It's just how much have you refined your gut? You know? Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, we'll come back to score studying just before the ten questions, which is the 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 you know, the unspoken eleventh question. Uh, I mean, what I find interesting, he's about the third teacher who uh, I've heard about who have has used this conducting in silence technique, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm because I teach myself. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to adopt more often. And try and shy away from the two piano thing because I just uh, I'm not a believer in the two piano thing, um, because it, as I mean I've said the quote often. Simon Rattle says learning to conduct it with two pianos is great if you're going to conduct two pianos. Um, yeah. You know the sound that comes from there is not an orchestra. It never will be. It never can be. Uh, and it, and it's so dependent on the two two pianists. Whereas if there are two people just listening to each other's inner ear in a room in silence you know you get you get to see what the gestures mean if you know the scores well enough you know I, I actually think it's a very good way of teaching so a good on him for doing it like that um it, you know yeah, it's, it, it, to, mean, I, to somebody I, I, looking through the window it probably looks like the bizarrest thing on the, on the planet but <laughs> not to us the thing with the the thing with the two pianos I mean I I had never studied conducting in the UK um in fact, I didn't study music in the UK at all. It was it's one yeah. of those sort of idiosyncrasies of my life. I spent the 10 years from 18 to 28 living in a different country and then the next 10 years being music director in, in Nuremberg. So I, I yeah. felt sort of disconnected, if you will, from, from all that stuff. And I don't have a great insight into how it's done in the UK. But in Germany, at least, the, the traditional point of the two piano system is as much for the two pianists as it is for the conductor, because yes. you need to train lots of repetiteurs, you need to train people to be able to work well in an opera house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's offering a rounded education for everybody involved. Um, and yes, 
I mean, I, I see so many young conductors who have just like, I mean, I don't want to sound awful, but there's like so many fundamentally problematic technique issues that yes, it would help to do it with a piano. You know, it's like so yeah. not right that even with a piano would be helpful, just giving two people a, 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 a pickup and, 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 you know, helping to coordinate a downbeat, but beyond the fundamentals, it's absolutely true. I mean, mm. the way woodwind attack or strings, even just strings, there's, there's hundred different ways to attack. So there's a hundred different ways to give an upbeat. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that once you have a feeling of how orchestras respond and every orchestra responds subtly differently to different gestures, you can then work with the piano because you have in your body and in your sense of, of you know, how you produce the sound, you can conduct a piano and you can say, all right, I'm gonna give this attack. And, yes. and so that way around it works well. But if you're trying to learn the feeling of, of what it's like for an orchestra to respond, it, piano is very difficult. Unless you have a master pianist then. There yes. are pianists who, funnily enough, earlier today, I, I just saw a brief video of Bernstein and um, the particular excerpt he was, he was playing, everything about his attack on the piano was like an orchestra. It was beautiful to, to, to listen to. And, you know, if you had Bernstein there, he could, yeah. in the attack on the instrument, the delay, he would be able to do it well. But anyway. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we can't all uh, have people like that playing uh, piano for us. Um, uh, the, interesting what you talked about there is the upbeat uh, there's a wonderful film which I'm, I cannot get in English. I've seen it with French subtitles and, and various others uh, about the um, conductor Gennady Rozhevetsky, and he talks about his teaching approach and he talks about the upbeat, which he was all about the upbeat, and and he, and he says I'll play them a C major chord on the piano and I want them to imagine that it's uh, violins and violas muted piano. Give me mm -hmm. that upbeat. Now mm -hmm. give me muted uh, three trumpets, but with a with a with a sforzando attack. You yeah. know, and it's all about the upbeat and what how it prepares the players to play on the downbeat. Um, the best place to learn about upbeats is to stand in front of an orchestra, but we can't all do that. We don't all live in. Yeah, by the Sibelius Academy or in Russia where they have these classes and schools. Um, when, I mean, obviously you were conducting your orchestra, the Schumann Camerata in Dusseldorf. Um, did Thomas Gabrich come along to any of your rehearsals and give you any sort of hands-on with your orchestra lessons? Uh, he did occasionally. He'd come along to concerts. He'd come along to some rehearsals. Um, and uh, he was... He was always very helpful. I conducted with him um, some some operetta that he was preparing. I conducted performances of Viva la Mamma, and um, he was always very helpful there. Um, it it was it was funny. It all moved um, it all moved very fast for me. I mean, I remember sitting when I was a kid um, at the canteen in the building that the BBC National Orchestra of Wales used to, to, to rehearse, and I don't know if they still do, um, but with Maris Janssens. Mm. My dad was, was, was uh, performing with him that week, and I had, you know, I was too young to even really be aware of just what an extraordinary musician he was and what an extraordinary conductor, but we were sitting at the table and dad was saying, I, I guess I was 15, dad was saying to him, oh, Alexander loves scores and he loves uh, um, the idea of conducting and he's sort of uh, trying it out at school and things and and Maris said well you know of course to learn stick technique only takes six months like if you, <laughs> if you learn from the right person if you learn from the right person yeah and the rest of it is then kind of refining it to your own um to your own uh, sort of personal sensibilities and also just cr discovering more and more ways to express with with the hands and with the body and um Gabrish Thomas was very much of that school too. There are mm. there are certain fundamentals that if you don't get them, you're never going to be a particularly virtuosic stick technician. Yeah, um, and it's surprising. I find sometimes observing some unbelievably fine conductors who, I mean, as in the results are sensationally good, and they're obviously incredibly charismatic people, incredibly musical and compelling where there are some elements of their stick technique which are just not as good as they could be or should be. Mm. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting because if they were concert pianists, they would just never have had a chance because if you can't get around the notes, you can't get around the notes. Yet yeah. it's, it, it's perhaps a clue to, to this sort of mysterious job that you can have people who have excellent technique where mm. they could really control anything. But above and beyond that, maybe you don't really have anything to say.
<laughs> yeah, and that's true. They tend to hit a, a ceiling way sooner than the people who have a lot to say and might be missing the odd thing in their technique. But I think obviously what one you know likes to observe and what one aims for oneself is to, to try and do both. You've just perfectly, well, in a slightly cheesy way, I'll, I'll use the link of clarity and wonder of stick technique, uh, was one of the things mentioned after you'd won the 2005 Leeds Conducting Competition. Uh, I told yeah. you that was a cheesy link. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you remember about that competition? Um, uh, you know, what, uh, what repertoire you had to conduct through well, and, well, um, and the final itself. How, how, how did you feel it went? I mean, most people who enter competitions enter them, I've discovered, thinking they're not going to win. Uh, what were yeah. your thoughts? Well, firstly, um, I, I, was, I was sort of uh, going to say before that with Thomas Gabrish and with my studies, it all went very fast because I didn't, yeah. you know, the first few years in, in Dusseldorf, I was, I was focusing on cello. I started the orchestra and I was building it and we were working together. And that was sort of three, let's say, years, four years, up until I was 23, perhaps. Um, and uh, maybe it was even, f yeah, four, yeah, it was four or five years of my studies. And then... Uh, Thomas got involved and we started working together and it was it cannot be more than 18 months of us working together that my dear mum called up from England and she said um, the Leeds conductors competition is happening uh, you know in six months or eight months or whatever yeah. um, you, you should apply and I said mum I'm just really starting to focus in on this yeah. um, it's way too soon way too soon but sweet mum that you think that it would be you know a good idea I love you and then she she kept on pestering me and so I, I submitted an application. I, I, you know, I filmed one of our concerts and some rehearsals and I submitted it. Um, and to my genuine surprise, I, I mean that genuinely, uh, I, I was selected to be one of the, I think it was 20 participants. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, that was interesting then. I, I basically spent the, the months then learning the music and preparing and having a lot of joy in doing that. Um, I worked through things, of course, with my, my teacher there. Um, some of the music, like Iber's Divertissement and other things I'd done with, with the, the orchestra already. Um, yeah. And then yeah, I sort of rocked up to Leeds. And, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I, I, I was very much outside the English system at that point. I, mm. you know, I'd come up from Germany. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, participants knew one another or they knew each other's teachers or, you know, there was a sense of, either camaraderie or uh, combative you know they know each other already and they're, they're they're in competition with one another already I was sort of blissfully ignorant of all of that um, <laughs> and had had real pleasure in just coming in and uh, for the first time in my life working as a conductor with the with professional musicians um, you know completely professional ensemble and um the, the joy of, of conducting these pieces with the Orchestra Opera North and, and um, being asked to do a bit of rehearsal and then by hook or by crook going on to the next day and always being a little bit surprised, but then the excitement of preparing the repertoire for the next day and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I made it through to, to the finals and there were three pieces up for selection, if I recall. One of them was Shostakovich's Ninth Symphony. One of them was Ooh. Death and Transfiguration. And one of them was, could have been Pictures and Exhibition. I'm not quite sure. Um, and they asked the, the, the three of us whether we had preferences. And Richard Strauss has always been just one of my very, very, very favorite composers for orchestra. I, I was listening nonstop to all of his tone poems. and. Um, and I did something very un-British. I remember at the time thinking, this is not very English of me, but I said, yes, I would like to conduct Death and Transfiguration. Mm. Um, because we're all being, you know, very kind of, well, what would you like? What would you like? And I just <laughs> sod it, I'm gonna say it. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, uh, the, the other two uh, colleagues in the finals uh, didn't actually want to conduct it anyway. They, one of them wanted Shostakovich and the other one wanted what I think was the Mussorgsky. So it kind of worked <laughs> out well. We all got the piece we, we wanted to. And I uh, conducted Death and Transfiguration, which is one of, you know, the most sublime scores. and. Um, yeah, again, somehow it was just the, the, the jury seemed to enjoy what I did and, and I won the competition. And that's when it's a very strange time uh, after something like that, because you're 
completely green. Yeah. You're passionate. You, you, you've just learned things. But a, a six, eight months later, I was standing in front of the Philharmonia Orchestra. And six months later, I was in front of the BBC Philharmonic. Um, because David Wetton, the, the then uh, manager of the F Philharmonia, had been on the on the jury, and um, the then manager of the BBC Philharmonic had come to the finals. Um, and these were great, you know, gifts. They're, yes. uh, they're unbelievably valuable gifts. The opportunity to stand in front of ensembles like that, and um, it is a a sort of baptism of, of fire. And the the idea that um, it, it's it's a very interesting one about competitions because without doubt, it, it, it sort of supercharged the early years of my, my career. And yeah. I like to joke with people that it, it's kind of the early years of a career as a conductor about being as good as you possibly can and, and burning as few bridges as you can. It's like you're not going to go in and necessarily change the, 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 the world with every one of these great orchestras that you go to. But what's important is to to be good enough and compelling enough and believable enough that they say, yeah, we want to work again with them. We want to keep that relationship going. Um, and that is, is, it's, I mean, I did not stop working, you know, 14, 15 hours a day for probably, probably up to COVID basically. Mm. Um, I mean, it relaxed a little bit before COVID because I made a very conscious decision when I started in Nuremberg as, as music director to just learn, learn, learn. Yeah, I programmed, hundreds of pieces, hundreds of pieces for myself um, and tried to stretch my repertoire as much as possible because I was, I was thinking, I was thinking about 40 years. I thought, right, if I want to do this for 40 years, the best gift I could give to myself now is in my twenties while I've got lots of energy is to learn, 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 learn and learn in a very intense and very structured manner so that when I return to scores, they're deeply embedded. And, um, and that all began with the Leeds competition that, that need, to be able to juggle a lot of repertoire, study very hard, and put yourself in a in a sort of mental place to be, um, to be you know productive and good in front of orchestras as as, as frequently as you can. Did you get any post winning aftercare? Uh, one particular competition, Besançon, gives you a year with somebody who's in the sort of management agent area and they look after you and there's somebody on the end of a phone uh, for decisions. I'm assuming with your, especially, you know, your father's still a concert pianist, uh, that, you know, he may sort of help you find an agent at this time um, and you weren't just chucked into the water, chum in the water and surrounded by a whole load of feeding sharks. Uh, what was it like? agent wise at this point had you already got one or you know was that the moment where uh you went went and spoke to your father about it well um the the short answer is that dad didn't actually help uh, at all not because he, right. he, didn't, want, he didn't want to um, yeah, yeah. but, but it, it, it worked out slightly differently there were a few agents who were present at the finals yeah who were immediately in contact with me and uh with whom i i i sort of corresponded and met up over the, the next few months. Yeah. There were a couple of other agents who weren't at the finals, but who then came to uh, see me uh, with, you know, orchestras around the country when I was there. And some of them came to Germany as well. Um, but ultimately it was, it was an, um, uh, it was an agent from uh, Askenaz Holt mm. who had represented my, my godfather, who's a pianist called Michael Roll. He was the first uh, winner oh, yes. of the lead piano competition. And Michael was no longer with Celia back then, but he said, I'd, I'd love for you to meet Celia because I think she's a very brilliant uh, agent and she's probably got some great advice for you mm. um, before I make a sort of decision. And, uh, and Celia and I met in London and then she came over to Dusseldorf to hear me with my orchestra to, to sort of see also this, um, uh, this series of concerts that we had done, which were really quite unusual. And, um, and that relationship blossomed and Celia took me on um, basically within, within it must have been six months or a year of the, of the competition. I think it was within six months. And I've been with Asking Us Hall ever since. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think it's, it's very important. The, it's, a, it's such a, a particular industry that we're all in. Um, it, it is not a panacea having an agent. 
no. it, it, it doesn't mean everything always works uh, the way you want it to. I see <laughs> plenty of colleagues who've, you know, some of them with illustrious careers who are constantly unhappy uh, with mm. their managers. Um, some people who feel incredibly well looked after and uh, well supported and, and feel like their managers are doing what they need for them. Um, I've always been thrilled to be with Askenaz Holt. Um, they, they, they seem, at least from what I glean from promoters and friends of mine who, who, who've worked from the other side uh, with them for many years, they seem to be an agency that um, exudes at least the right sort of core values, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's also important for, for sort of who, who one wants to be as an artist, you know, what kind of people do you want to work with? Um, but anyway, that was uh, also a, a an incredibly important part of what what, what doors the competition opened. Yes, um, of course. And I don't think, in retrospect, I would have uh, done it any other way. The the pure weight of stress that's put on your shoulders, and um, when you when you win a competition and people start to invite you, is huge. But but honestly, if you you know, if, if you're not comfortable with stress in this profession, then it's not going to be an easy profession. I mean, <laughs> you, you have to be someone who can can uh, deal with that. I'm going to jump on uh, to basically you've had two quite long periods as chief conductor. Um, one, as you mentioned, in Nuremberg from 2009 to 2017. And now from 2013, uh, and I think I read somewhere this morning that your contract's been extended to 2023 with the National Arts Centre Orchestra in Ottawa, Canada. Yeah. Um, with both of those orchestras and also with your Schumann Camerata, you have done some pretty incredible projects, a lot to do with youth and the community you were talking about a set of concerts encouraging mm -hmm. people in their early 20s to come in to uh to see the schumann camerata but I, you know you've done it in every place you've been um mm -hmm. and also conducting youth orchestras the german national youth orchestra i noticed as well i know it sounds like a banal and stupid question but i, I you know why is it so important to you to get these projects and up and running uh, quickly and um to try and you know reach youth community aspects of music making uh well i there's there's so many different reasons that i i think it's important uh firstly uh they are the future audience yes without without an engagement with and an access to an appreciation and a fun um associated with classical music why would we have an audience in in 40 years why would those young people uh come to to concerts i think that's you know a a, a starting point a, another point is that it is in, in the interaction with the generations that are starting to define themselves and just start, starting to define the um, conversations of our time mm. that our own art form uh, creates its future. So the creative artists, composers, um, uh, opera directors, uh, so on and so forth, who, who work within our industry have to be listening to those conversations and responding to them. Um, yes. That's that's why art is created. So it's very important also to be in dialogue, uh, to be listening, you know, what moves you, what doesn't move you. Know, are, there, are there universals that, that transcend generations and transcend cultures? I think we all probably agree there are, but yeah. are there also things that are unique to um, this, this generation in this country, in this, in this town, in this part of this town, in this country? Yeah. Um, those are the conversations for which we make art, I think, um, art is is not just a sort of abstract. It's about, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's about communication. So what are we trying to communicate and who are we trying to communicate with? Um, classical music is is a is a an entire realm. It's such a it's such a funny thing that the misconceptions and misperceptions of that word for, for, for many people, they they think of it as narrow and, and I think of it as extraordinarily broad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's music of today. It's music of the 16th century and everything in between. And it's from six continents. Um, yeah. And we all know that, but possibly too rarely do we actually celebrate it, and possibly too rarely do we actually do anything about ensuring that it remains so. So people, in in you know my position, if I'm leading an organization, um, the easy thing, if you will, is to be programming 
the, the Mozart and the Beethoven and the Strauss and the and the Mahler and you know the Elgars. That's yeah. There, there there is an audience for that, and we need to make sure that we continue and and also question traditions that in equal measure we need to do that work which is something that we tend to get very well trained for in the music industry but there is a, an entire world of other things that we need to do which are incredibly exciting um, that have nothing to do with that and one of i have very few frustrations i generally a very sort of optimistic <laughs> person and, and grateful person as well but the uh, it frustrates me when uh, it's considered either or options. You know, a good arts organization needs to be great at uh, traditional things. It needs to be great at developing new ideas. It needs to be great at communicating with uh, demographic X and great at uh, communicating with demographic Y. And those two things uh, should be an, uh, not mutually exclusive. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's always been a sort of the core of, of what I think is, and and, for, for some people, when they look at my career, they, they're like, oh, look how much you've done with, with youth. And I, I personally just see a balance, uh, what I consider a healthy balance, which is to, yeah. to work with all different demographics and audiences. So. Well, it's something the listeners will know that I agree with um, about working in your community, if that means mm -hmm. a good amateur orchestra or your local youth orchestra, um, but also taking it one step further, also as a conductor. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some people really are quite quick to want to put us in pigeonholes oh you know he's an early music expert or she's really good at Britain or Amala but you know I wouldn't necessarily book her to do Beethoven or you know he does contemporary music or he does you know light crossover work, film music whatever mm -hmm. you want to do personally as a conductor I like doing them all and and mm -hmm. you know I don't I don't mind doing them all and I don't want somebody to pigeonhole me and say, oh, he's really good at British music and Shostakovich. So mm. don't, don't give him a concert of um, English light music to do. Well, why mm -hmm. not? I, I might like it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I might really enjoy it. And it might be a secret passion of mine, you know? And, and I think, you know, as musicians, uh, you'd be crazy not to embrace all music and also want to take it out to your community and your youngsters. Um, so does that frustrate you when people, you know, say to you, oh, well, maybe you should concentrate more on, well, you just mentioned it, Beethoven, the classics or whatever mm -hmm. else, or does that frustrate you? Because it sounds like you're somebody like me who just likes music and therefore conducts whatever comes in front of him. Um, so I do yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, I fortunately sort of suffered, if you will, from, from, from that. I, yeah. I think one needs to make, well, one doesn't have to do anything. The beauty of life is <laughs> no. that people yeah. can just do whatever, yes. be yeah. whatever they want and it leads yeah. wherever it leads them. And I, you know, from that perspective, they're kind of libertarian. But yeah. um, right now, for example, in Canada, we're in the middle of a, a big recording cycle of all the Brahms symphonies, all the Schumann symphonies and uh, orchestral music by Clara Schumann plus um, her chamber music and songs. And um, that is a project over a couple of years. I've done cycles yeah. of the Schumann symphonies and the Brahms symphonies before in concert. But when I apply myself to that repertoire, I am digging and digging and digging and digging and trying to, um, for the stage I am in life, be as profoundly connected with the music as I can be. So mm. I am trying in, in, in that project to be as expert and specialized as I can. At the same time, a few weeks ago, we were continuing a, a different project, which we call NACO Live, which was where we've been over the last 18 months, really focusing on um, what are called, you know, IBPOC in Canada or BIPOC uh, co uh, composers in, in, in the States. And, you know, they call different things in different places, but yeah. um, composers from historically excluded communities, which is another way to put it. So okay. um, a lot of black composers, uh, a lot of Latin composers, uh, women. And we've, we've had a, uh, you know, in, in the last 18 months, I've been focusing so hard on expanding my knowledge of that repertoire, picking works that I think will work fantastically. And we've, we've basically had 18 months of programming of exclusively that. So we've, yeah. we've uh, featured like, huge name a list of names like George Walker and Jesse Montgomery, Coleridge Taylor, Hannah Kendall, great British composer, and yeah. uh, Erlen Wall Wallen as well, Carla Simon, um, some Canadians like Barbara Pentland and Violet Archer, Angelica Negron, brilliant Zosha de, Castro, uh, de Castri, um, brilliant young Canadian composer, Anna Klein, Jocelyn Morlock, Kelly, you know, the list goes on and on. These composers yeah. who are brilliant, but they're not, they're not, 
some of them particularly well known, but I've spent so much time digging into that so that I, when, when I'm putting these concerts on and when we're streaming them live out to the world, that they are packed with as much personal integrity as I can bring to them. I really feel like I'm very knowledgeable about these people and their repertoire and that we pick repertoire that I believe will, will really speak to audiences. And, um, and then we're doing a project called Undisrupted, which is uh, about responding to the, the social justice conversations of the last two years, which have been frankly as impactful, I think, as COVID has. Yes, the, that's true. The, the yeah. change on our world, uh, the change brought about, in, particularly in the Western world, in the last two years has been as strong from, from, from Black Lives Matter and, and Me Too to a degree and, and as, as COVID. So we, we tried to create a project that says, how does a national orchestra, like the National Arts Centre Orchestra, the National Orchestra of Canada, hmm. respond to these questions of our time. How can you use the orchestra as a tool that for communities that might perceive for right or wrong, for better or for worse, the orchestra as a tool of whatever you want to insert here, you know, colonialism yes. or white, white something. Like how, how, do we, how do we respond to that? And this pro project that we created Undisrupted really dealt with that. And I had you know, many, many, many hours of meetings and discussions with artists and, and then, you know, constructing that together with the CBC, the equivalent of the BBC over here. The, my, my point being, in each and every project, if you, look at, if you look at sort of what I do, you'll see, oh, well, he does this and that, and that is very broad. But I feel that within each and every project, I'm going very deep. Oh, yes, um, yeah. So, well, no, and I, I know that, you know, probably everybody says that, but what I would not like to do is simply touch the surface of lots of different things. And I'm not sure that's as, as, as sensible. It might look nice on the surface, but it's important to dig. Um, and so I try at any given point to have a few balls in the air um, that I'm, I'm juggling, but I'm investing a lot of time and thought in each of them. And I do tend to perceive my work in several year increments. Mm. So I like to say in the next two years, I'm going to be focusing very intently, my real focus on Brahms Schumann symphonies and creating a set of recordings that really mean something to me and, and have as much integrity as I could possibly manage. And, um, and then saying, right, well, what's the next two years afterwards? And of course, then I'm also guest conducting with a bunch of programs that have, have come together in various different ways. And maybe a soloist yeah. is there before I was, or maybe they're doing a, what? For example, when I was with Suisse Romande just before the, um, just before COVID started, they were doing a Shostakovich Britain cycle. And so they came to me and said, we'd like you to come uh, back and would you do this, you know, part of this cycle? I thought that's great because that also has sort of integrity and meaning. Mm. Um, so again, when you're looking through the calendar, you might see lots of different things, but I try in my mind's eye to, to have a, a real focus for something personal that I'm trying to achieve. And then when I'm guest conducting, try and be in the minds of the programmers and the, and the projects I'm in. Um, and actually, if when I, when I, again, when I talk to, to, to young conductors about the career, I, I, I sort of talked about stress earlier and how one needs to be able to absorb it. Being capable of really clear compartmentalization is, I think, an incredibly important tool to develop as well uh, to achieve success um, in the career that we, we have. Um, mm. Because if you can't compartmentalize and really focus on something, even if it's only for 10 minutes and then move <laughs> on to something else, it's, it's, it's very hard to deal with the sheer amount of repertory that gets thrown at us. Well, you've led in perfectly to um, the question I ask all of the conductors because it's about score preparation and learning scores. And at some point, if you're doing your homework, uh, as you said you are, and we all do, um, what point of the process do you go and do your research on uh, who are, you know, the, the underrepresented composers or, or even Brahms or Schumann? Um, mm. And then when you come to learn a score, are you somebody who sits at the desk using your inner ear? Are you somebody who starts big and goes small? And for the real conducting gate, and for the real conducting geeks, are you a pencil user, a scribbler, a red and blue and black, a highlighter pen, or are you somebody who uses none of the above and keeps it nice virginal white? What do you do when you learn a score, Alex? <laughs> um, I'm a pencil user. 
Yeah. I open up page one. Yep. And uh, what I do is it, every piece I learn, I do a very thorough uh, harmonic and structural analysis. So I actually yeah. write chords under everything as I go. I mark periods, um, uh, so with vertical lines, and then half strokes halfway through a phrase. Um, I will. I have notes that I make and indications that I make for different elements of the structure. And certain certain structures become apparent as I'm going. Other ones, I you. Uh, you you say all right. I think it's heading this way. You you see how a composer has has started to lead us in one direction or another direction. And sometimes the solution to actually the construction of a movement might be in the middle of the development section, or it might be in yes. the coda. And yeah. I've often spoken to people about there's two two forms of beauty when you're when you're learning music as a conductor. One is one is when you get to perform it and rehearse it. And, you know that bringing to life of the sound. But there's a very different one, incredibly enriching, without which I couldn't live, which is that time at a desk, getting into the mind of how a composer has put it together. And that, mm. those moments sometimes of, um, uh, of, of clarity, like it happens all the time. I mean, I remember the first time I really studied certain Beethoven symphonies when I was uh, you know, in my late teens, I, I thought, I just can't find a solution to this. What <laughs> is happening structurally? And then, you feel the hand of Beethoven touch you in the middle of a development section because it's like, he's just indicated, he's just given me the answer to the thing that I've been asking myself all the way through. And of course, it's never a coincidence. Mm. It's, it's why the tension is felt in the music. And sometimes I can't put one's finger on it, but it is the playing with one of the most obvious examples, which I hope everybody who you've ever interviewed has given a lot of thought to, um, and I'm sure they have, but it's interesting for audiences, is are the first three notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony pickups yes. or is it a heavy bar you yeah. know that is one of the most obvious in all of music you need to answer that question for yourself as an interpreter yes. now it may be that it sounds identical afterwards possibly i don't think it will but it's possible but if you haven't asked yourself that question and then spent many many hours picking it apart um then you, for my taste you haven't you haven't really connected with the score in the way you have a responsibility to do as a conductor so the the analysis the musicological analysis actually is really what we're talking about yes it's always is always the starting point for me and Beethoven's fifth is not a bad example that he he originally wrote out the opening and then he added another bar in it right which so when you're right, you analyzing yeah. it for the first time you think hmm why did why is it written like that and it, it throws a spanner in the works right off out of the gate in in terms of the, these four bars or three bar periods and so on and so forth and then then in the research afterwards, quite often it'll happen in parallel, but sometimes it happens afterwards. You realize, oh, he added that, and that helps to confirm or sometimes to complicate a decision you've already made or a conclusion that you've come to. But um, ultimately, I would say that the work at the desk, which is, yes, it's inner ear mm -hmm. um, and it's with pencil, is about trying to get to a clo as close to the truth, a truth, of how a composer has conceived of a piece. So these, and, and to, to answer your question about big to small or small to big, it, it means that from the small, ultimately I then see the big, but the big is, makes a lot of sense in my mind already because yes. yeah, yeah. all the great symphonies, and then we can get into also the aesthetics of what beauty is, but all the great, it's not even symphonies, most of the great, works in music that I can think of and also outside of the classical realm tend to have in miniature what they have in in their large structure and you know then you get into the whole world of Gödel, Escher, Bach and fractals and beauty and nature and how um, these you know fractals work and it's, 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 it's to be seen and, and heard in music but um, that's stage one is is learning it at at the table and as I'm sure, again, many of your guests have said, and I'm sure you're aware, what's shocking sometimes is how, if you were to tell me to write down a piece that I've heard but never seen the score of, how often what I would write down from things that I've heard over the years has nothing to do with what's written in the score. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that's I'd, true, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say, well, this is a 5-4 bar, and it turns out it's a 4-4 four, four bar, but yeah. there's just a tradition to always extend the last beat, or there, I would write a ritenuto here, or, um, you know, like much bigger things even still. And that's a very interesting process. So, yes. you know, we talked about the Brahms symphonies. Um, I mentioned, you know, recording them. There's, there's a whole load of 
uh, in any one of those symphonies, a whole load of, of, of traditions and balance issues and um, uh, structural questions, tempo issues that when you see the score for the first time, if you're able to clear your mind of those things, you'd actually probably start from a completely different place to what you're used to. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that what you're used to is wrong, but it's, I think, kind of incumbent on you as a, as a, as a musician to get there yourself and understand why you would possibly get to that tradition mm -hmm. um, rather than just say, well, it is the tradition, therefore it must be good. Because for every tradition, I can find you an example of a counter tradition. I mean, it starts with Fort Bengler and Toscanini, you know, in the recorded history of music. If, if anybody tells you that they used to do something a certain way, well, there's always, you know, for, for at least 20th century musicians, um, a recording that can be found that completely contradicts it. Absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely true. At this point, I asked Alex when he starts his research and listens to recordings, which led us on to discuss how studying should lead to integrity and respect. I also asked him about his role at the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and how conductors need to learn to rehearse depending on the time available. If you want to hear that 11-minute discussion, I've turned it into a Patreon-exclusive bonus mini-episode. For as little as £5 a month, you can get access to this mini-episode, as well as all of the previous mini-episodes. You'll also get a monthly bulletin podcast from me about my career, as well as advanced news about this podcast. You also get an interview once a month with a prominent person from the classical music world who has dealings with conductors, as well as articles, essays, and all sorts of other conducting-based content. The details of how to join are in the show notes below, and I'd love to see you subscribe to the Supporters Club Bob and Mike on the Podium very soon. Now, it's time for the 10 questions with my guest, Alexander Shelley. Alexander, it is time for the 10 questions, and as everybody knows, I start with, what sound or noise do you love, and what sound or noise do you hate? I'm going to stick with, with, with sort of real musical stuff. So... I, I, I think the sound of an A tuning, um, not because it's necessarily the most beautiful experience in the world, but because of what it heralds, that, yes. that, yeah. that focusing in of, of, of everybody on stage and the audience, and then this anticipation of, of the journey that's to come. I, I, I think I'd just pick that, even though it's kind of a, a random one. Um, and sounds that I dislike, I, it may be a cliche, but the bagpipes are it's, it's, it's a complicated. <laughs> Complicated relationship with that instrument. I suppose I should find the intervals beautiful because they're very natural, but it, I might put that on my list. Uh, have you ever conducted uh, Orkney Wedding with Sunrise by Peter Maxwell Davis? No. Well, if <laughs> if any piece is going to turn you on, I, is that the right phrase? Turn you on yes. to the bagpipes? I don't know whether it, 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 um, it will. I, I'd never conducted that piece, and I did it with the BBC Concert Orchestra, I don't know, five or six years ago. And in the concert, when the bagpipes started at the end, I had the hairs on the back of my neck go up. And I thought, really? Bagpipes are doing that to you, Mike? But no, well, actually, musically, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I agree I with you it. in every other every other circumstance with the bagpipes, but yeah. not no, that. So um, I, try I, it one yeah, and, and actually, it's, it's a, a uniquely, hauntingly beautiful sound as well, despite yes. all the weird. I, no, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when there's, you know, 40 of them, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a sound you want to run away from. Um, <laughs> number three, if you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? Well, uh, I love sport um, and it's a very important sort of contrast to, to what I do uh, the rest of the time. So I think I'd probably choose uh, training like tennis uh, in a very hot, humid country, just like a day of real intense training, hitting a ball, uh, focusing on something completely different. Yeah, something away from music. And yeah, I, I'd spend it in the summer months uh, going and playing cricket on a Saturday. And nice. I, def you know, I, I might have something I hum in my head as I'm bowling. But other than mm. that, music is not involved. And none of the people I play with are musical. And none of them care a toss about what I do. We, you know, we just go there to play cricket. Uh, and you see, you're right. It turns your brain off, doesn't it? It's, yeah. It free. does. Exactly. Who would be a favourite conductor of yesteryear? I'm sure, like, almost every guest you you have on here, I'm, a, I'm just a fan of so many different people. And... and is the beauty of, of our world that there are so many great personalities and, and, and sort of viewpoints on pieces 
Yes. But I think number one of yesteryear from a conducting perspective and interpretational on the very small amount of repertoire that's left behind would probably be uh, Carlos Kleiber, <laughs> but also his yeah. father. Also yes. his father, Eric yes. Kleiber, who is one of the most succinctly beautiful conductors that I, I think ever ever lived. Um, very different uh, technique, but there are there are elements of it that really do mirror what, what Carlos Kleiber did. So yeah. uh, not an unusual response, I'm sure, but um, it is genuine. Um, and I think because it's it's almost impossible to imagine that they are of yesteryear, I'd have to mention also Maris Janssens and Bernard Heiting. Yes. Because they, they're so recently deceased, but they are two absolute giants. There's, there is not a note that I know of recorded by either of those conductors that is not brimming with integrity. Mm. Um, mm. It is always refined. It's always elegant. It's always full of integrity. Um, and I think we may have lost two of the very, very, very greatest who ever lived in, in the last few years. That's true. And I think you're the first conductor I've spoken to since we lost Bernard Heitink. Um, and yes, I mean, the tributes, uh, are just, you know, from everybody. Uh, and most of them say, you know, they didn't even meet a musician who didn't like him. All the musicians had good things to say about him. And that, yeah. for a conductor, as we know, personally, is pretty rare. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we uh, we definitely, um, uh, people form opinions about their conductors, but to be roundly and loyally loved by musicians, orchestra musicians, is something else. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, we've talked about, you know, us, um, current conductors, uh, can you name a few current conductors? Some people find this question very hard, some find it very easy, and a couple of people have refused to answer it at all. <laughs> um, well, like, I'm a fan of many, many living conductors for, yeah. for lots of, of different reasons. Um, I think it's someone who I pick because they, are, they represent many opposites to the way I, I think I approach things. Uh, but I find them unbelievably, unbelievably compelling musically and exciting and thought provoking. Uh, it would be would be Valery Gergiev. Uh, um, yes, he he's somebody I, I played under as a cellist in the World Orchestra for Peace and on tour in Russia, and he exudes the essence of music mm. in any given moment. And I, you know, you, you talked about. Heitink and, and no one ever saying a word against him. I think there may be the odd musician in the odd orchestra who's had the odd experience, you know, in concert with Gergiev that it hasn't gone completely smoothly. I, I wouldn't want to speak to that, but the, the sheer storytelling mm. that he embodies, I find extraordinary. I, I think he's, um, in terms of musical charisma, whether, whether one agrees with every decision or not, um, is such that he sort of transcends that decision making. You know, he, he'll do yeah. something and it'll be fast, or it'll be very slow, or it'll be a, a unique color that you really wouldn't expect in that point. Um, but it's driven by something very special. Um, so I think I'm, I might mention him for those reasons, yes. um, while remaining a fan of of many, many of my colleagues at the same time. Yeah. What is the hardest work you've ever conducted? <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I think it's going to be completely unexpected, uh, my okay. answer, um, which was that it was Charlie Chaplin's City Lights, the film. Ooh. Um, this was, uh, I think it was my first season in, in Canada with the National Arts Centre Orchestra, and we did a big festival um, of uh, sort of early 20th century, the around basically around Paris and New York, something I also yeah. explored with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. But um, one of the evenings, we thought it'd be fun to show City Lights yeah. with um, the orchestra playing it live. Mm. Uh, and I'd never done that. I'd never conducted a, you know, a, a, the soundtrack live to, to a film, but I thought, why not? It'll be fun. So um, this was alongside, you know, just so much other repertoire in those, in those few days of the festival. And I thought, great, what a, what a wonderful challenge. And then I started getting into it. I, I got I sent the score and they sent me the film <laughs> and I, I watched it and I watched the score and I thought, well, 
this is going to take quite a lot of work. Firstly, just it's a <laughs> brilliant yeah. score, but to align everything is going to take a lot of work. And so I thought, sorry, I'm going to just really go for it. It's fun. And, and I, by the way, I mean, one of the great things about life, but definitely our profession is if you decide to just do something really, like really work on something, it always gives you something back. Yes. And I spent hours upon hours upon hours watching Charlie Chaplin having not really had a relationship with his movies at all before then. Yeah, um, yeah. Not really thought very much at all. I was like, oh, Charlie Chaplin, I bet he's great, but I don't know why. <laughs> and then watching him, for, I was just the genius of that man suddenly became apparent to me. Um, I say suddenly, it, it, it developed, you know, he's just yeah. extraordinary. Anyway, I watched it and 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 watched it. And then we got to rehearsals and I was so proud because like, I hit like, all of the scenes exactly in the right time and, um, but I thought, my God, these people who conduct films, that's so difficult. And then the leader of my orchestra came up to me after, after this and he said, where exactly was the, the, the timer and where were the, the, the cues for you? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, whenever we do pop shows with films, you know, there's the timers for the conductors and, yes. and with the beats per second. Yeah. So you can, you know, it gives you a click. So you know what? And I said, well, no one told me about that. <laughs> and, and I'd invested tens and tens and twenties and hundreds, not probably not hundreds of hours, yeah. but a lot of time because I never, no one had told me that there was a thing you could follow that would give you all the exact speeds <laughs> yes. so that would line yeah. perfectly. Yeah. So that was like per, per minute of music conducted. That was definitely the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> but then well, I was really proud after the fact, and I've never been able to tell anyone, so I'm glad you've asked me. Uh, oh, well, brilliant. Oh, well, well, having I did uh, North by Northwest, the uh, Bernard Herrmann score to the Hitchcock film. Right. And I, I used the Newman, the Newman system, which is the punches and streamers, and there's a clock in the top right-hand corner with the bar number and the tempo you're getting It's at. even got a name, you see. Yeah, yeah the Newman system, yeah, and, and, uh, and that was hard enough. And I've also okay. done, and I'm about to go to Trondheim and do the snowman, uh, Harold Blake's, you know, the famous yeah. walking in the air. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's only 20 minutes, and uh, I actually do use a version with the clock, but I know a lot of conductors who don't. Uh, yeah. and that's tricky enough but the whole of city lights uh my hat if i was wearing one would be doffed in your general direction <laughs> <laughs> but not using Thank anything you. other than just watching the film that's some going that's wonderful <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> when traveling abroad to conduct what item could you not leave home without uh can i have two it would be of running course. shoes and a thought-provoking book and yeah, running shoes, obviously. Thought provoking book. Are you, I mean, uh, you know, if you're going back to Ottawa, I'm assuming you've probably got a place there, so you don't need to go out yep. and eat. But when you're guest conducting, you know, a, a table for one and a book is sometimes the best way of getting through it, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant answers. And um, yep, you join a, a, an ever growing gang of of us all who have a thought provoking book for a table for one. I'm just mm -hmm. not in, I'm not in the gang with the running shoes. I'll leave that to you. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, number eight, uh, anything you want is the answer to this real or fantasy, whatever you like. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? Um, I think some of the misperceptions um, both within and without the industry, within and outside of the industry, maybe the way to put it, yeah. about what a conductor does. I think that it's a, a wonderfully mysterious realm for audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and mystery is important, especially in art, but demystifying certain aspects, uh, I think it would really be interesting for a lot of audience members. Sort of looking behind the curtain, understanding a little bit what happens in rehearsals, how, how a conductor can be an incredibly useful tool mm. uh, when things are, are working right, you know, how, how um, that role uh, is, is something that is actually essential. You know, it, it didn't just occur for no reason. It, it, it occurred because ensembles need to have decisions made, need leadership, they need direction. Um, I think sort of look, looking at it from that perspective and also understanding a little bit more about the gestural side of things for audiences, I think, is is very interesting. Mm. Um, so, so that misperception, uh, or maybe even just lack of perception of, of certain things about a conductor, I, I think that would be something that I'd like to change. And in fact, I try 
quite often to do that, you know, talk to audiences about it, talk to, um, to people about the, the nuts and bolts of conducting. Mm. Um, and also the nuts and bolts of the life of a conductor and a music director and, and the, the huge variety of decisions you have to make and, and things you need to think about, which are incredibly fulfilling. Well, if you take the gestural part out of your answer, you've basically described one of, if not the biggest reason why I started this podcast, which was to have two conductors talking to each other and not to consciously demystify, but just through chatting about yep. what we do. Uh, you know, you're never going to take all, all of the scales off the eyes of, of somebody and you can't explain everything. And, and I, actually, as us conductors, we can't explain it either sometimes. But, I, you know, mm. just to point out, you know, this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how long it takes. This is why we do it. This is why we, we shouldn't do that and we should do this. Uh, and I'm hoping after, you know, approaching 100 episodes that, it seems that some people uh, have found it interesting and have been informed. I wish I could do the gestural thing, but it, then it wouldn't be a podcast. It would be a, a vlogcast or whatever it's called. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, a brilliant answer. Absolutely brilliant answer because it's something, as I said, I'm quite invested in myself. So there we are. Mm. Um, number nine. Uh, and again, real or fantasy. What profession mm -hmm. other than your own would you like to attempt? That's really uh, a, a really interesting question um, for anybody to think about, isn't it? Yeah. I um, I love psychology. I love behavioral psychology quite specifically. So, mm. thinking about what, this period that we're living through now uh, with COVID, we're traveling from country to country, the different ways different cultures and communities and societies uh, deal with it how they perceive information, statistics, data, conversations, um, the, 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 the fundamentals of decision-making, mm. they're fascinating to me. Um, and in fact, we've, we've, some, quite a lot of our programming in the coming year is around that. We, we commissioned um, Philip Glass to write what, will, what is his, now his 13th symphony. We're giving the world premiere of it in a, in a, oh. in a couple of months based on the, the, the life of a man called Peter Jennings, who was a Canadian television news anchor, mm. but who was uh, for generations, well, a generation, the, the, the face of news in the US on, on ABC. So a Canadian who made it big in, the, in America. And you know, using that as a, a lens through which to talk about truth and how we, we observe it, because mm. for, for decades, a, a news anchor stood for that sort of veracity of, of you know, research. And when they said something, it was honest and truthful. Yeah. Um, and it's something that Philip Glass is very interested in too. So he's written this symphony for us. And, and um, it's something that in our conversations around music, but in life in general, I find very interesting. So perhaps working in the realm of, of uh, psychology and uh, I think I'd probably always enjoy being active um, rather than just sort of in the academic side of it. But that's an area that I'd, I'd be very interested in. Uh, writing, I, I think I'd be very interested in, um, and, and perhaps something that sort of brings the, the behavioral psychology stuff to bear, which is potentially sort of diplomacy, politicsy type stuff, maybe policy stuff. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure about politics as a profession, but the, the things that you can do once you're in power, like thinking about how to make things better and thinking about how we all interact as a society that stuff fascinates me um basically it would be ppe if i went back to university i'd be studying uh, you know politics philosophy and economics that, yeah. that, those would be the, that would be the subject i love or um you know in the top 10 tennis players in the world that would be my other dream <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's quite a few conductors who slip in something you know or fast bowler or england cricket captain or whatever <laughs> exactly yeah, absolutely but i mean you know psychology doesn't surprise me because you know, you mentioned it earlier on in, in the chat, uh, but it's part of what we do as conductors. You know, if you're not interested in the psychology of the people you're conducting, then maybe yeah. you shouldn't be stood up there in the first place, you know. Uh, well, I think there's probably, I, I don't know, someone would need to study it, but I think there's probably a slightly higher rate of sociopaths among conductors than there are in the general population, because the, <laughs> the alternative to, to really caring about people is to not care at all, yes. right? to sort of enter yeah. into the sociopathic realm. Yeah, 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 that's true. There's a few of those as well. Absolutely. It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And finally, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, firstly, I'd have as many friends and family together as possible to make yep. a big party. Yep. And I think uh, a good old fashioned clash of burgers, fries and salad with like 30 or 40 bottles of something delicious, like a 1982 Latour or, you know, like some, some <laughs> wonderful yeah. red wine. So on the one hand, you've got like nice, earthy, simple, straightforward food. On the other hand, you've got something godlike to drink, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, why not go out with a bang? I mean, you know, you exactly. don't need the money the next morning, so spend it exactly. on the wine. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I've had a wonderful time. It's been uh, a superb way to spend a, an hour or so, Alex. And I hope in the future, maybe we won't spend quite so much on the red wine, but we could, you know, sit down over a burger and a, and a, and a decent I'd red wine that. and carry on chatting. Thank you. I'd love that. A Mic on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal, with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with an Israeli conductor who studied and assisted Daniel Barenboim. He spent the early part of his career having positions in opera houses in Israel, Austria and the United States. But since 2014, he's been principal conductor and artistic advisor at the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs>